Um, thanks to the organizers and everyone else involved. So this work, I think, is a little bit separated from a lot of the other works. Uh, this conference is combining some theory of cryptography and a lot of classic computational learning theory. So uh, for those reasons, and in spite of those reasons, I'm going to attempt to define literally zero things uh, for this talk, but encourage you to please find me at the poster session with any questions. So in a model extraction attack, there is an adversary who tries to uh, maliciously interact with some interface to a machine learning model in order to try to extract that model. So in this case, what I mean by extraction is find some other model that agrees with the original model on uh, a very large fraction of the points. So why would you want to try to extract a model? Uh, well, one of the obvious things is in the setting of machine learning as a service, um, usually a client has to query or pay for every query that it makes. So anytime it can steal a model and infer uh, the labels on points it hasn't seen, then that's kind of stealing value. Um, perhaps more interestingly, it's also been shown that model extraction can aid in doing other types of violations of security and privacy. Uh, for example, model inversion or adversarial examples. Um, and in particular, this has been done for malware, uh, adversarial examples, and also reconstructing of faces from data sets on facial recognition models. And this first work is Biggio and others, and the second is Fredrickson and others. Uh, so how could you defend against model extraction? One thing you might try is to limit the amount of information that's revealed per query. So you could do this by injecting noise. Um, you could do this IID per query, or maybe you could even convince yourself that it's OK to m deliberately modify the underlying model. Um, but I'll say that I guess this necessarily sacrifices accuracy. So for many types of applications, it might uh, not be satisfactory, like, for example, um, medical diagnosis. So what else you could do is you could try to use some kinds of cryptography. Um, so one example, and this isn't a direct application, but you could think that this is related is secure function evaluation. In secure function evaluation, um, there's Alice who's holding a model and Bob who's holding an input and they try to jointly compute the output of the model on that input. Um, and, and they wanna do this in such a way where each learns nothing about the other's respective input. Um, but crucially, this is nothing beyond what's revealed by the output of the model. Um, so this is great for one instance, but it doesn't really say anything about the case that we're working with, which is where there might be a lot of repeated interaction. And another thing you could do is try some fancy program obfuscation, um, but that also kind of suffers from the same problem because uh, by definition, it's not gonna modify the underlying model. The functionality will stay the same. So for our type of extraction, it's no good. So a third type of defense, which is the last one I'll talk about, and the focus of this work is something that I'm calling an observational defense. So in an observational defense, there's a server who's holding the model um, and they take a bunch of queries requested by the client and forward those to the observational defense or OMED for short. And the job of the OMED is to analyze that set of queries and basically output a decision, accept or reject. Um, if the outputs accept, then that is the OMED informing the server to forward the labels back to the client. And if it's reject, then it means to basically bin those requests and ignore the client. So there are plenty of instances of OMEDs in, in the literature. Uh, these are some listed on the screen from a practical, studying this problem from a practical perspective. Um, they use a lot of amazing techniques. Um, to basically try to make the decision, is this client adversarial or honest? But I guess the broader point here is that these uh, types of defenses, although being lightweight, which is also great because it goes directly on top of the model um, and it doesn't increase communication much, um, is that they, they're just kind of boiling down to efficient statistical tests and they don't really come with any known provable security guarantees, at least uh, nothing that's really kind of reminiscent of what you'd expect from cryptography. And so I'm not gonna to attempt to define what I mean by provable security, but I'll at least start by telling you 
uh, like things we definitely can't do and what might be reasonable. So first of all, um, we can't hope to rule out extraction from clients who can query the model as much as they want and run in unbounded time. And uh, by now, I think this is referenced as something called a pack learning attack because it's derived from pack learning, which will basically just tell us that if the client or the learner is um, able to obtain a bunch of examples along some distribution that it wants to learn on, then it'll get to a point where um, eventually it will be able to reduce training error in such a way that it will generalize well. Um, so that's out of the question. So the first thing we could do is try to restrict clients to query some polynomial number of times or run in polynomial time. And, um, but this is still not enough because uh, there's still efficient pack learning with queries. And so this is different than the normal setting where the learner can arbitrarily synthesize its queries however it wants. And we'll get to this a bit later, but one example you could think of in your head is, uh, you know, polynomial size Boolean decision trees. This is true for that. So we need to restrict the client even more. And this is basically where the OMED comes in. Um, the OMED wants to test for an honest distribution. And I think this is, this is nice because it's, kind of motivated by uh, quote unquote nature's distribution, which is the setting where maybe the client is getting some unlabeled examples from some natural distribution out in the real world and wants to get those labeled uh, from, the, from, the, from the model. Um, but at the same time, like it might be the case that from this natural distribution, it's like very hard to actually uh, learn the model by, you know, just from that distribution. So I'll, Add to that in a minute. Um, but the last thing I want to say on the slide is that this is also kind of a typical cryptographic setting where we're aiming, going to aim for like one efficient defense uh, that runs in fixed polynomial time against all polynomial time adversaries. So concrete setting, um, you've got this distribution coming from nature over unlabeled examples of, of n bits. And um, you know, let's say that learning a model from labeled data sampled IID from this distribution is extremely hard, both computationally and in sample complexity. But if one can acquire data on arbitrary points, which is very expensive, let's say, then one can learn a good model efficiently, um, you know, with much less queries. So suppose there somebody does this and um, learns a model and now wants to profit off that then what they would want to do to defend this is to basically try to force the client to query IID from that natural distribution. Um, and uh, under kind of a well-observed assumptions in, in learning theory, um, there are plenty of examples where it would be the case that it would be pretty hard to learn if you're forced to only obtain examples from that distribution. So yeah, to recap, OMID's job is to kind of just enforce this uh, situation. So the natural question is, well, can we build these things efficiently? And one of the main results of this work is that um, for some cases, the answer is no. Uh, so one theorem is that you can't build an efficient OMED for Boolean decision trees of polynomial size um, when that natural distribution is the uniform distribution. And that's under some fairly standard cryptographic assumptions known as learning parity with noise with sub, sub exponential security. Um, so the way we do this is mainly by, or chiefly by making a connection with this covert learning model uh, from prior work of Ron Canetti and myself, um, where we're basically entertaining this learning setting where one, there's a learner who makes queries uh, kind of out in the public square, meaning that their goal is to do some kind of learning with, with queries, but uh, do this while there's an adversary who's watching. And so the goal is to learn some function, but uh, while preventing any adversary from doing the same, when that adversary can view the entire transcript of those queries and answers. And the crucial thing that makes this work is that the adversary can't see any of the internal randomness of the learner. Um, so some random coins that the learner has flipped. And um, this, this is formalized with, with uh, kind of in the simulation paradigm from cryptography. But I think for now, the important thing is that, you know, there actually exists learning algorithms where the learner will query with pseudorandom queries on a, on a decision tree um, that uh, still allow it to learn. And so this is in contrast to the case where 
the examples are truly uniformly random. So how does this connect back to our setting? Well, um, the idea is basically that these algorithms essentially fool the OMEDs. Uh, and you could see that by kind of making a connection here by equating the adversary from the covert learning setting to an OMED um, and the learner uh, on, the, on the screen here to uh, the client. So basically in the model extraction setting, what the client wants to do is um, submit a bunch of queries that uh, look random uh, to the OMED. So that kind of shows the, you know, the um, correspondence between the adversary and covert learning and the OMED and the learner and the client. So going further, um, arguably doing the OMED with uniform, you know, the natural distribution being over uniform is not very realistic. Certainly not realistic in the image recognition uh, cat dog thing that I was doing on the screen. Um, but so one thing you would want to do is to try to expand the number of distributions or the type of distributions that uh, you can do this for. So we go on in this work to extend this. Um, so what we end up getting is that you also can't get efficient OMEDs for Boolean juntas, the test for product distributions. And that's under the same learning parity with noise assumption. So this is nice for a couple of reasons, um, at least because juntas are they're functions that uh, basically are only depend on a small number of the inputs. Um, and this is often motivated in DNA or biological applications where the model gets like some very large string of DNA and can often make a decision off of a very small slice of the data. And it's good because the negative result is for more types of honest distributions being product distributions, uniform distribution is just one special case. Uh, but one drawback is that the juntas are uh, kind of a natural subclass of, of poly-sized decision trees. So just to finish up, I'll tell you a tiny bit about the techniques used to do that. Um, there's this uh, technique called learning with distributional inverters uh, that appeared in ALT earlier last year. And um, the point of that work is to try to reduce learning with respect to some fancy distribution to uniform distribution. And so in our work, we basically show that this technique we kind of poured it over to the covert learning setting with the um, security guarantees and then build on top of, of the other algorithm. And that gives us this negative result. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you.